Uh, hello? Okay. Well, welcome to the physical security uh, workshop. Uh, Mark Seiden from the US and myself, I'm Barry, um, will we'll do this workshop. Uh, it will be two completely different uh, approaches of uh, physical security, but you will see that. Um, I will start off. Uh, my name is Buddy, Buddy Wells. Um, I'm the founder of uh, Tool, which is a lockpick sport group. Uh, we are based in Amsterdam and we focus on lock security for fun, but also um, yeah, because we're really, really interested in that. Um, the organization in Germany is called SSDEF. You can see them downstairs. Uh, they have ongoing lockpick workshops, championships. Um, it's, it's, it's a very great force of knowledge, um, these two organizations. Uh, a lot of people focus on one small part, find something interesting, share it with a group of people. Uh, by now it's like 1,500 people who are into this sport or into this physical security as a hobby. Um, and it's amazing what people can pull off. Uh, and I hope to demonstrate some techniques that uh, I hope will amaze you. Um, when I visited my friends from the German group uh, a couple of months ago, there was a demonstration by a person called Klaus Noch. He's a, he's a German guy. And he found out uh, a trick to open locks, which is known for 50 years, but nobody seemed to understand the real implications of it or how to use it exactly. And uh, if you know how to use this technique exactly, you can open 80, maybe 90% of all the locks, all the normal pin tumbler locks, uh, with very little uh, knowledge, uh, under 30 seconds most of the time. Uh, and I will try to explain how. Uh, first of all, you need to know how a lock works. Now let's see if I can... Oh, and we need a laser pointer that we can control, not that you will point for me. Uh, does anybody in this audience have a laser pointer? Ah, there we go. My friend Paul Wouters. Give him an applause. Okay, this part of the session worked, so now if everything else goes as smoothly as this, I'll be very happy. Uh, let's see, how do I... Fl space. Well, there you go. It's not Windows. Space, you said. Spacebar. Yeah, spacebar. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Backspace. No. No, 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 this is not going well. No. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hey. Okay, well, at least now people cannot blame Windows. That's, that's a good thing. Anyway, um, how many of you people know exactly how a normal pin tumbler lock works? Okay, well, that's about 50%, I would say. Uh, for the other 50%, I will try to explain. Um, when you insert a key into a lock, what happens is that uh, a set of pins, and that's that. Uh, this is a cutaway view of a lock, and if you insert the key correctly, uh, and the key is the correct key to the lock, uh, there's two rows of pins, five, uh, five stacks of pins, um, that the point where they, the, the pins are on top of each other needs to be in one straight line, namely the line um, uh, where the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder uh, uh, touch each other, and, and that's a little bit complicated. Um, I do have a cutaway lock. Let's see. Yeah, it's still in my bag. Um, but you, you, you could, uh, and, and here is the um, lock when it's uh, tilted a little bit. You can see here the lower pins, and here are the upper pins that are spring loaded. Uh, but but a, a lock is nothing more than a collection of uh, two pins that are stacked on each other. Uh, with a little spring that keeps them under tension. And if you insert the key, and the key is the correct one, uh, all the uh, lower pins are aligned in the exact position, and then the lock can turn. If one of these pins sticks out too high or too deep, uh, the lock cannot turn because it will be jammed by these pins. Um, I hope people understand this concept. 
a lot of people are shaking yes, so thank you. Um, okay, now this is, this is an interesting concept because how do you pick a lock, for instance? Um, well, what you do is you put the lock under tension, so you want to turn the lock. The pins are not in the correct position, but the, the pins all have a small uh, tolerance, uh, a small mechanical um, um, uh, mis... How, how, how do you call it, Mark? Um, yeah, they're, they're very uh, small differences. So, uh, and normally you exploit a uh, lock opening like that, but this is not what this technique is about. This technique is about um, Newton's law, and you already saw the second slide. Uh, how many people know this uh, device, the Newton's cradle, with the balls? Um, I found some video, and this guy actually uh, did something clever. Uh, he dressed himself in black uh, when... <laughs> Oh, there we go. How, how, how do I turn this video on? Uh, you click on the black shirt. I click on the black shirt. <laughs> hey, there we go. Okay, everybody seems to know it, but this is what happens. The energy of the ball on the left is being transferred through all the other balls and uh, is being transferred to the outside ball, which, when it bounces back, transfer some energy back, but what, what counts um, for this new opening technique is the fact that energy is being transferred, transferred through uh, metal objects to the last part where there is nothing that, that holds it and then the energy will come free and move that object. And, and this is something very important to understand in, in what I'm going to tell next. Um, because uh, this um, this can be also used with, uh, with, with locks. Now, locksmiths know for, I think, 50 or 60 years uh, the joy of a so-called uh, lockpick gun. That's this one. Uh, this, by the way, is a special lockpick gun that's modified by Kurt Schulke um, to also operate on European locks. You can operate it upside down or the normal way around. That's because pins in Europe are so-called upside down and pins in the US are the correct way, as, as they call it. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and here's an ancient version of, uh, of, of a pig gun called the snapper gun. And you can actually, from a, from a piece of metal and little practice, uh, make a, a, a tool like this yourself. Just bend it and, and hit it with a hammer and uh, grind it down a little bit. And you'll have a tool that will open uh, locks uh, for a few times because then the wire breaks and uh, but but anyway how, how does it work um, if you see this needle here with the pig gun and uh, with the snapper gun what you do is you insert it into the lock and you reach all the five lower pins you tilt you you lift the pig gun till you feel that you actually are hitting all five lower pins at the same time you pull the trigger, and when you pull the trigger, um, the, the needle of the, of the pig gun will actually transfer some uh, impact energy. It will go click, and it will hit up or down, depending on if it's a European lock or not. Um, but but when, once it does that, the lower pins will stay in place, as, as we learned. Uh, the lower pins will stay in place, and the energy is being transferred, just like the Newton's cradle, is being transferred through the first pin to the second pin, the second pins, all five of them, will jump up because of the energy that's being transferred by this needle. And at the moment they're jumping up, there's a gap. And that's the gap we need to turn the lock. So if you have a pig gun, you just insert it into the lock, make sure you hit all five pins at the same time. Um, you insert something called a tensioner, which you, you, it's a small metal piece that you use to rotate the lock at the moment that the gap is there. So. Um, yeah, this, this has been used by locksmiths for, for over 50 years and it still works on 50% of all the locks. Uh, if, if you ever lose your key or ever, if you ever lost your key, you might have seen one of these pig guns because it's what uh, pros use on a daily basis to, to open doors. Um, now, the lock industry tries to defeat that and what they did was... Oh. Yes. What they did was, uh, to, to tease us a little bit, is uh, design keyways 
that are very, very narrow. Uh, this is an EFA lock. It's a, it's a pretty high security lock. And why is it high security? Because the keyway goes zigzag from one side to the other. And it's practically impossible to insert the needle of a pig gun or to insert uh, lockpick tools into this keyway. Uh, so so it's, it, it was, uh, until a little while, virtually uh, pick proof. It was very, very difficult to pick it, especially since the pins can be very long or very short. So sometimes you need to lift pins uh, very high end. Sometimes you barely have to touch them. And if you have a combination in your lock that's high, low, high, low, it's very difficult to, to defeat it. Um, however, with the new technique that we learned, uh, namely, no. namely bumping. Um, I, I consider bump keys the biggest threat in physical security that I've learned of in a long, long, long time um, because it can open almost any lock I've seen so far um, with very little uh, knowledge and, and practice. Um, together with my friend Rob Hongrijp, I wrote a white paper about it, how it technically works. Uh, I will show you the URL at the end of the, the demonstration. Um, but what you see here is actually uh, a bunch of so-called bump keys or 999 keys. Uh, why 999? If you have a, a key copy machine from a, from a key copy shop uh, that can computer cut uh, keys, the deepest cut in a key normally is, is the 9, uh, meaning that if you set your key copy machine to 99999, um, it will copy this key. It will cut as deep as the, it, it will cut all pins as deep as the, uh, the tolerances normally are or, or as the spacing normally is. Um, and you can see here a bunch of uh, 999 keys. So these are all cut to the, to the deepest. Um, and as you can see, there's also some special keys, but I will get, uh, I will get to that. Um, let's see. So, What's special about the bump key? I mean that you can make a key that's 999, okay, great. But what, what, what is this about? Um, what is this about is, uh, first I will have to explain a little bit about how a key normally works. What's important with a key is the so-called shoulder. The shoulder is the point sticking out that will prevent the key entering the lock deeper than a certain position. If you ever went to a key copy shop and they messed up your keys, nine out of 10, uh, they put the shoulder in a, in a wrong position, uh, meaning that the cuts that normally lift pins to a certain angle uh, were in the wrong position and therefore your lock didn't open. So it's very important that the shoulder uh, compared to the cuts is in the right position. Uh, well, this high security dome lock um, is now cut to 999. Uh, these are the cuts. Um, and, and what we do with uh, bump keying is we take off half a millimeter of this shoulder. So if I normally insert this 999 key into a lock, not a whole lot will happen. Um, the cuts will hit the lower pins. They, they will just be there. Uh, the pins are not even lifted. It, it will just make contact with the pins. Nothing, nothing happens. Um, but what we do is we take off a half a millimeter of the shoulder. And then what happens is that you get this spacing here, as, as you can see on this picture. Um, there's a small spacing, meaning that if I now press the key into the lock, um, I feel actually that the pins are lifted a little bit because the, the angle of the cut in the key will hit the pin and try to lift it up just a fraction. And the more I take off the shoulder, um, the more it will move. But the trick is, half a millimeter, maybe even quarter of a millimeter, a very, very tiny fraction of, uh, of, of the shoulder needs to be taken off. And also, um, you take off a small part of the tip of the key, but I will get into that uh, a little later. Now, for bump keying, you need um, a, a, a hammer. Uh, what we're going to do is, once the key that can go uh, half a millimeter deeper into the lock than normal, uh, once we insert it and we hit it with a hammer, a lot of energy is being put in the lock. And the only way that the energy that went in can come out is through the upper five pins. And it doesn't matter how hard I hit it, the energy has to go somewhere and uh, it will go through the lower pins into the upper pins. There will be a big shear line and the lock will open. 
Uh, this works on, as, as I mentioned before, uh, well, maybe 90% of all the locks. There, there are some sidebar locks that, it's, that, that resist this type of attack, but um, I will demonstrate a few locks that uh, people might think, well, you can't possibly open this lock. Uh, yeah, we'll see about that. Um, this, this hammer, by the way, is a special hammer designed again by uh, Kurt Schulke, who I'm a big fan of. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a plastic hammer uh, with a little plastic weight on it, and it's very, very, very effective. I'm happy I brought two because uh, 30 minutes before the workshop, my original hammer broke, and this is my backup, so. Um, yeah, well, then uh, I will now start the demonstration, and then people will say, but you possibly cannot open uh, this type of lock. Well, let's, let's see how far I get. Uh, can you hook up the camera for me? Good. We will start with, uh, with the very difficult uh, keyway of EVA, the, the zigzag motive. What, what, what's that? I don't hear what he says. The mouse cursor. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, this, this, this is a lock that normally is uh, very difficult to, to, to pick. Um, this is the, the bump key that we made for it, and as you can see, it's, it's cut to the deepest. Uh, well, I took off some of the tip, as you can probably see, it's, it's a little flat. And um, I'm not sure if I, can, if I can open it on camera, but I'll try. Everybody wants to be a movie director. Open. So this is this is your uh, this is your standard uh, five pin um, yeah lock that that people w uh, who spent a l uh, more than normal amount of money. Uh, uh, put on their door. <laughs> now I go to um, I go to the next level. Uh, it's a seven-pin uh, lock, a so-called um, dimple lock, or Bohrmulden shoots, whatever they call it in German. Um, and and it's from uh, from multi-lock. Uh, they make several types of locks, and this is the easiest one they got. Uh, the little plastic you see here is actually uh, designed by Oliver Diedrichsen, who sits over there and tries to be anonymous, but uh, I spotted him anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, what, what, what he actually did is use some, um, some hot glue to make sure that the, um, the key would not enter the lock too deep. Uh, there is no shoulder on this type of, of um, key, so what he did was use some uh, hot glue uh, to, to, yeah, to make sure that the lock, uh, that the key wouldn't enter too much. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can open it. It doesn't even want to enter the lock. <laughs> now the, the problem with bumping is that uh, these locks sometimes uh, are destroyed. Hmm. Oh, there goes my demo. Does anybody have a lock pick with them? I need to turn the pin a little bit. It's dented from all the blows. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll go to the to the next one in the meanwhile. Um, there's uh, this this. Okay. There's no software used in this demo. Okay, well, we'll forget about this lock then. It's too bad. Um, 
uh, this, this lock that I didn't open uh, had seven pins and the seven pins were all from the, from the top. But there's also uh, locks that have pins from multiple sides. For instance, there's a lock called uh, Linse. It's, uh, it's this one. It has uh, ten pins, five pins from the top, five pins from the bottom. And when I asked my, uh, my key, uh, my, the, the, the person operating the key machine to make me a bump key for this lock, he said, well, what's the combination that you want? Six is the deepest I can cut with this lock. Uh, I said, well, make it 666 on one side and 666 on the other side. And he did that, and guess what? He uh, cut through the key. <laughs> so it seems that um, if there's a cut six on one side, on the other side, it, it's not allowed to go deeper than a cut four. If you do that, you cut through the key. Uh, I entered it into the lock and thought, what the heck? And voila. There's even uh, locks that have 15 pins. Uh, <laughs> now, this, this game goes on and on and on, but um, yeah, this is actually what it looks like. It's got uh, pins everywhere from three sides. Um, I'll give it a try. Open. Now, there are two more, two higher levels than these two locks, or than these locks that I demonstrated. And um, the thing is, I've been practicing uh, one hour before when I broke my hammer. Um, and there's two locks that are even uh, uh, more high. And one is the, um, oh, it's turned on. But at least we know how to make you laugh. Anyway, um, yeah, one, one of the most high secure locks at this moment, or at least that's what people like to believe, is uh, the multi-lock interactive. It's a pin-in-pin -pin system, meaning that uh, instead of normally there are two pins in a lock, uh, here are four, meaning that the lower pin is hollow and contains a second smaller thinner pin inside that pin. Um, so, yeah, the pin and pin system is overestimated for a long time, uh, although I'm not allowed to say that. I was on Dutch television uh, at prime time in some uh, news show, uh, and somebody gave me one of these locks, and I couldn't open it for an hour. So, uh, what, what, what am I to say? And, um, yeah, the same thing could happen here, because uh, I've, I've had quite some success opening this uh, multi-lock interactive, but I have no idea if, you know, a thousand people watching or, or how, how many there are now, if it works or not. Um, I'll give it a try for one minute. If it doesn't work, you know, we'll see how I try to back off. Okay, I'm happy that the score now is multi-lock one, berry one. <laughs> okay, and then uh, there's another lock that um, I personally never, ever, ever dreamed of opening uh, with any lockpick tools whatsoever. Um, we lockpickers sometimes have a favorite lock that we really, really like. And the Asa Twin, uh, it's, a, it's a sidebar lock which has uh, six normal straight pin tumblers as, as in a classic original pin tumbler system, but also the sidebar, which is the combination below here. Um, that, that sidebar mechanism is so ingenious, it's, it's very, very hard to pick it. And I would call this lock pick-proof, 
Uh, it's in use by a lot of governments, a lot of big corporations, and this is about the most secure lock, uh, about the most secure lock you could buy, uh, until this uh, discovery. Uh, the, the, weak, <laughs> the, 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 the weak spot about this ASA twin, as, as what it's called, is that the sidebar combination, which actually is the mechanism that makes it very difficult to pick or very difficult to manipulate, even with bumping, um, is it works with solid pins, and it goes too deep in, into uh, technical detail to explain exactly how it works. But if the sidebar combination is unknown, bumping doesn't work with this type of lock. However, um, to make it easy for uh, key copy shops or, or whatever, or, or key shops, is that normally they sell these sidebars in regions. So for instance, in uh, Berlin, the code is 954. I'm not sure if you can read it. Um, that means that if you go to a Berlin copy shop or a Berlin key shop that sells Asa Twin, uh, 9 out of 10 will probably sell you the 954 sidebar combination, which is this combination. Um, so the, the thing that makes the lock so strong actually works against them if you can buy the same lock as your neighbor. If I know that my neighbor uh, bought a lock uh, in the area, I can buy a lock at the same shop got the same uh, uh, sidebar combination, cut it to 999 and open it. Now, this lock is, is an 80 euro lock and I opened it, I think, uh, 100 times. And uh, the problem is, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, you, you can, you, you can see it here, um, the lock dents at one moment in time. It's, it's, a, it's a steel lock, it's, it's a very, very nice, very strong lock, um, but it breaks when you bump it uh, over 100 times. Um, I will give it a try to see if it opens. Uh, again, I will take one minute for that, not, not any longer than that. Uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, I'll go into a little bit more uh, detailed technique of, uh, of, of why it works and how it works. But let's first see how far I get. Open. Okay. I'm not sure if there are locks of gods, but they're, today they're in my... Yeah, whatever. Okay. Now, what, what, we, found, uh, what, what, what we found out during uh, examining what exactly goes on is that the more expensive a lock is, the more tight, the, more, uh, yeah, the, the less play there is in the lock, uh, n uh, normally the more difficult it is to manipulate if you want to pick a lock that has got very high tolerances, um, it's, it's very difficult. But with this technique, um, you transfer the energy, and if energy gets lost because pins have got too much space in the chambers or whatever, um, it doesn't work. So this technique works best on expensive locks. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, there's nothing that I can do about that, but I, yeah, I personally thought it was very funny to find out that the more expensive uh, a lock is and the more work that they put into engineering it as tightly as possible, uh, the more easy it opens with, uh, with, with bumping. Um, yeah, so, so this basically is what bumping is all about. The, the white paper is online. It's, uh, it's on tool.nl slash bumping.pdf, uh, but as I said, it will be at the end of the show. Uh, the, yeah, we, we will show it to you. Um, as I mentioned, there's only a few locks that resist this technique. And, um, yeah, for instance, mechanical locks, uh, no, magnetic locks, uh, locks that use uh, magnets to, um, to, to control the opening mechanism, uh, they are resistant against this. Um, and a few other high security cylinders, especially with sidebars. Uh, nine out of ten sidebars is the code word. But then, of course, only if the sidebar is not sold in every shop in the same region uh, for the same time. Um, so this, this is the thing about bumping that I wanted to say. Um, are there any questions so far? Where can you get the hammer? Uh, I, I paid 10 euros. So, that, so, so that's not too much. Uh, people use uh, the wooden handle of a hammer, just the, the handle itself, or people use uh, the end of a screwdriver. Uh, yeah, there, there's many things that you can use to hit the lock. But personally, my big favorite is this, uh, yeah, this tomahawk uh, hammer. Um, but yeah, maybe you can make something yourself. I don't know.
Do you, know, do you know if we can detect uh, this kind of specific attack on the, on, on the lock with a forensic study? Um, we, trace. Yeah, sure. We, uh, the, uh, we tried to do it with the naked eye and with a magnifier and see if we could detect if pins were hit, uh, or if pins were hit with the bump key or if not. So we opened, so, so we opened the lock ten times with bump keying. Uh, took it apart and we took the same lock apart and with the naked eye and with the magnifier we couldn't find it although I'm 100% sure that uh, the real forensic expert uh, will definitely be able to see it because the amount of force that the hammer puts in, in, uh, uh, onto these pins really is bigger than you should expect uh, sometimes you miss the key and you hit your finger and then you realize <laughs> how much Any more questions? One more. Uh, are you explaining attacks against uh, the magnetic locks uh, later on? And are you uh, uh, recommending or suggesting which locks to buy uh, to prevent attacks? Well, if you would have asked me six months ago what, what lock should I buy, I probably would have said an Asa Twin would be a pretty safe choice. But <laughs> uh, Although with my company, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, making sure that no, no people come into the building without being noticed. I mean, if they break in the door, that's fine. Well, it's not fine, but um, <laughs> then, then at least we know that we got a visitor. Um, and yeah, our, our locks have to be uh, tamper resistant, so we have multiple layers. Uh, but we don't use the Asa Twin, we use something called uh, Abloy, uh, which is actually, it, it works with disks instead, um, instead of pins and it's called Abloy, A-B-L-O-Y, um, but you can look into that. Uh, I'm, but, but normally I've learned not to suggest any locks to anybody because if it fails, uh, yeah, people complain with me and it's free advice, so. More questions? Ah, one more. Yeah. Uh, where can you get the 9 and 9 keys? Uh, yeah, you have to be friends with a locksmith. So, yeah, you, you could either try it with uh, some flowers or chocolate or... Uh... <laughs> okay, um, then we leave the questions for next. Uh, Mark, if you would be so kind to remove your laptop because I'm going to demonstrate something very dangerous. All the way. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's distance. Yeah, you, you might think that I'm joking, but actually I'm not. Um, okay. Um, on the same workshop where I learned about um, uh, bump keying, yeah, now we can show the slides. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. I'll, I'll show you the slides later. Okay, let me put it on the floor here. Push past the sound. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just do your demo and I'll, I'll do this. Okay. Um, on the same workshop in Germany, I learned about something else. Uh, I remember well that about one and a half years ago, I visited a friend of mine at his company, and uh, he looked at me with a big smile and said, you're this clever lockpicking guy, aren't you? Uh, now pick this. And he showed me... What's that? Well, hold on. Take care. <laughs> and, and he showed me um, this plastic key uh, with, with a blue tip, or no, with the blue handle, um, and it's known as the Winkhaus blue chip. And the Winkhaus blue chip um, is something that's the next generation in, in uh, locks, and they're very proud of this technique. And uh, people who know me and who know my background know that... Sorry. Uh, anyway, people who, who know me and my background um, know that I'm into uh, encryption and, and crypto. And uh, when I first learned about this lock, uh, I was really impressed. Because what it does is it uses 128-bit encryption um, 
to secure your locks and, and doors, uh, which is pretty impressive. What it does is, in the tip of this uh, key, there is a um, here. There is a small uh, RFID challenge response type of chip. It's wireless, and um, yeah, as you can see here on this fuzzy image, um, as soon as you insert it into the lock, it will uh, do a challenge response 128 bit um, with the small uh, microprocessor that's built into this lock, which is you know a, a, a big deal by itself to uh, miniaturize it this way that it all works well. Um, and uh, if the challenge response is, is right, uh, cryptographical challenge response, um, there's a small pin here um, that's being pulled down, and if it's pulled down, the lock can rotate. Uh, and this really is a very clever uh, design. And the people of what? Oh, sorry. All yeah. sorts of stuff going on here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, Mark is making sure that you're not falling asleep. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, um, so, so uh, I, I was impressed and pissed off that my friend told me, you know, you, you cannot open this lock, and I knew that he was right. That was until I visited my German friends, and what did I see? I saw actually a blue chip, a, a Winkhaus blue chip lock. And uh, what else did I see? Uh, they had the key that does not operate the lock. So there's no transponder in this key. It's, it's a blank key. It, it, uh, it's a demo key. Uh, and if you insert it into the lock, it will turn 45 uh, degrees, but then the pin will prevent it from, from turning. Now, nice and well. Um, what did somebody find out? And here's where the dangerous stuff uh, OK, this here is a very strong magnet. And I'm not kidding that it's very strong. If you buy it, it comes in a box, and the box has a big skull and bones on it saying, beware. It's also called in German the totus magnet. Uh, um, this, this has got multiple reasons. One is uh, that it will destroy any hard drive that it comes in, uh, nearby. It will destroy your credit cards. Uh, one magnet has got 85 kilograms of, uh, of pulling strength. So if somebody weighs 80 kilos, supposedly, uh, he, he could hang on the magnet. Um, this, this is a very strong magnet and it's very dangerous. It's also dangerous for another reason. Um, if this desk was made out of metal and I would be here and demonstrating the, the magnet, it would jam. It, when, once it, it grips, it would uh, smash my fingers and I wouldn't pick locks for a little while. So, uh, <laughs> so you've got to be careful with this type of, of stuff. Now, what this guy found out is... I told you. I'm not sure if you can see it, but... <laughs> now, this magnet can be bought for 39 euros. And the lock is a 250 euro lock. <laughs> yeah, and, and you might think it's funny, but um, I, can, I can tell you that the company Winkhaus did a pretty bad job fixing their problem. And I will first put this away. Okay, um, Winkhaus did a pretty bad job uh, fixing the problem. Uh, they know about it for at least six months, and then there was the so-called security show in Essen, which is a very, very big trade show, and they had this big stand that was almost the size of a football field, uh, and uh, 100 meters away from that stand was a stand of uh, a guy called uh, Wendt, Mr. Wendt, who sells lockpick tools, and he was demonstrating to everybody who wanted to see that you could open this expensive lock with a magnet. <laughs> so they had this, really this huge stand, 
And they were making a fool out of themselves because they known it for at least four months, is what I've been told. And they tried to put it under, under, the, under the carpet, uh, as we call it in Dutch. I don't know if it's an English expression, but they tried, they tried to put it under the rug. Um, so as soon as the security showed, these people started to demonstrate it in the open that the lock could be this easily defeated. Um, they had to do something. So they made a security alert. Uh, they opened a hotline in Germany, not in Holland. Uh, they opened a, a hotline in Germany saying, all our customers who read this, uh, you know, contact us. I would do it personally, I would do it the other way around. I would try to contact my customers and say, we have a problem uh, and, and we will fix this for you. But they say, well, you know, if, if you read this, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, two weeks after the show was over, um, so was the web page. They pulled the links. Uh, we found that the document uh, containing the warning was still there, but th there's nothing that reminds of this big gap. Uh, now, with Tool, um, we got a lot of people visiting us, um, including, for instance, a big multinational in, in Holland who had a problem with their physical locks. Um, and I explained them what their problem actually was. They had problems with uh, people stealing some stuff from them, and they had no idea how these locks were opened. It seemed that it was pretty easy, uh, but, but they couldn't figure out how it was done. And then the guy said with a big smile, well, at least our factory is secure now because we have these uh, computerized locks. I said, is it blue? And then his face turned white. <laughs> And he looked at me, shaking, said, you are kidding. And I said, well, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not. And um, uh, I, I didn't have one of these magnets, but I shot some video. And when he saw the video, he got really, really angry because they just installed it very recently uh, because they had some problems, people stealing stuff. Um, uh, to the highest level of the board of directors, uh, all the locks were changed with this blue chip lock. Um, and now he found out that with 39 euros, uh, people could bypass it. So he got angry, sent an angry email or, or called to Winkhouse and said, what's going on? And they sent back the lamest reply I have ever seen. Uh, yeah, we tested it with ferrite magnets and uh, the other magnet is a very special, dangerous, blah. Uh, 39 euros, you can buy it on uh, supermagnets.ch. Uh, and, you know, and, but, but they said... Um, in January, we have good news, in January we will fix your problem. For 9 euros, we will upgrade your lock and we will build into your locks that you send us. Uh, so when the locks are in transport, you know, you maybe have to hire a guard or I don't know. <laughs> but when, when they get your locks, they will upgrade them and they will build in some mechanism that you can see that people use the magnet to open it. So you buy this 250 euro lock per lock, eh? I mean, you know, big plans and big... Uh, um, and um, also my friend from the multinational found another big multinational that uses the same locks, got the same upset uh, reaction, and this was maybe two months ago. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, I tried to buy one of, the, one of these locks from Winkhouse and they didn't want to sell it to me for obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, but the guy from the multinational gave me the one that was on the board of directors room. Um, I could have that because it had to be changed immediately. And then recently for my uh, company I visited some people that do VIP protection service and they protect the Fortune 500 people in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, he googled my name just as the first step of a small security clearance. And when he googled my name he found tool and he, you know, he asked what, what it was about. And then I told him some stuff and I told him about, you know, how we tell people that some locks are uh, not safe. And I told him about the blue chip and then he said, <gasps> um, there was one of his big clients that just had his whole villa changed. Um, so there was an uh, uh, emergency call made. And I mean, this is a few months after the security show in Essen. Customers are not aware of this problem. Uh, I hope maybe this, the, this uh, workshop will contribute that they will get their act together and do something serious about it and not make a detector for nine euros that you can see that your whole warehouse was robbed with a magnet. Uh, <laughs> okay, now um, I'm, I'm going to close off. 
uh, some people, uh, especially in the security industry, think that I got a big mouth. You know, I uh, show people some security holes. Uh, yeah, th that's the way it goes. Uh, on the other hand, there's now, I, I think there's more than a thousand people who are into computers and security. And I would like to challenge you to hack me. Uh, not hack me personally, but people who know me know that, um, that I, I'm involved in a, a company called Cryptophone. Uh, we built a secure, untappable uh, GSM mobile phone. That's, uh, that's this one. Let's, let's just show the video. Yeah, it's it's in the black, okay. and I'm clicking it. <laughs> you click in the black. All right. <laughs> ah, hey. Well, if you go here. No, it should. Okay. Every day, everywhere, valuable information is exchanged by telephone. Even organizations that spend large amounts of time, effort, and money securing their offices and networks still discuss sensitive information over unprotected phones. This happens in a world in which competitors, criminal organizations, and foreign governments can tap into this wealth of information using cheaper and more readily available tools than ever before. There are several ways to intercept a cell phone signal. A device called an MC catcher can be used to capture your call by anyone in your vicinity. But once your call travels within the network of your cell phone provider, there are still ways to listen in as the unencrypted signal travels from one cell tower to the next over a microwave link. Not to mention the threat of competitors bribing cell phone employees or foreign intelligence agencies listening for information that could benefit their national industries. Now there's a product that will prevent unauthorized access to your conversations. The Cryptophone is an easy-to-use cellular phone that uses state-of-the-art military-grade encryption to safeguard your privacy. There's a free downloadable version of the Cryptophone available on your website that turns any ordinary PC into a Cryptophone. Encryption is a fine art and prone to mistakes. That is why we publish the source code of our product on our website. The worldwide community of mathematicians and cryptographers can and does verify the integrity of our product to see if it's free of mistakes yeah, yeah, yeah. or back doors. <laughs> For more information, visit our website. Okay, so far the commercial break. But, <laughs> but the, 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 the message is clear. If you want to uh, see how we of Cryptophone behave when uh, a, a vulnerability gets found, uh, please download the source code. Everybody can do it. Have a look at what we do, how we do it. And if you have any comments, good or bad, we would like to hear from you. Um, this is my part of the presentation. If there's any questions, uh, now is the time. Or otherwise, we can do it after. OK, then uh, I will now let Mark do the talk. Thanks very much. This says now hack Bari. It doesn't say now hack Mark, by the way, even though we're presenting together. So I'm going to talk about something that's somewhat more abstract than the nuts and bolts that Bari has demonstrated so ably. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk to you all. Um, and it's really nice to be in a conference where wearing my usual t-shirt, I'm one of the best dressed people here. So I'd like to talk more abstractly about why physical security is important. And, and in order to do that, I need to define it. And it really involves access to tangible assets or the artifacts that represent them or the access to them. So you know, it, it can be a whole range of assets that are not normally considered to be such. People are assets and computers, the network plugs that you can plug into, your telephone switch, the keyboard interface of a sysadmin, an unencrypted backup tape or an entire set of backup tapes. Keys on the floppy disk, hardware keys for example. The list of code names for the deals in play. 
personnel database which can enable you to, to uh, steal the identity of an employee, the access control computer that lets you into, you know, in, that decides if your badge is valid for that door at that time, maybe the master key in the coffee cup of the facilities guy. A clear view of the safe dial, can be, uh, which can be videotaped, can be turned into access to the safe later on. And of course, the money or the bearer bonds in the safe. So we can talk about physical security at lots of levels, from a very high level, security on planet Earth, perceptions about which have become really elusive since 9-11. Uh, the contortions in people's decision-making process have become visible to almost anybody who's been through an airport in the last several years. The problem is you can't economically secure anything large against a determined adversary who has assets, with, has, who has substantial resources at their disposal. And people are not rational when they make these investment decisions about security. So the politicians, who are salespeople fundamentally, try to grab land and use the fear cell to persuade us that security is more important than other things, like freedom or privacy. And we've never really thought about these trade-offs. We, uh, we as a public have never thought about these trade-offs deeply, so we really don't know how to react to these, these fear cells. At a lower level than 50,000 feet, in the business environment, there have been some nasty trends in the last few years that reduce security, particularly the ability to control or audit. For example, initially, there was centralization of control and operations, which meant making the wires much longer than they used to be. That was a first bad tendency. It meant you were trusting somebody at a, at a great distance from you. Then we started using outsourcing outsourcing to external entities that now we have to trust. How do we establish a basis for trust over these people? And now there's a lot of offshore development and operations, particularly customer service is moving offshore uh, to places like India and Canada. And that means that the offshore people need access to all the personal information of our customers in order to authenticate them and act on their behalf. At a lower level even, there's physical security in the enterprise, in the company, which relies on, uh, there are all of these factors which cause problems in, at that level. There's fragmented responsibility and authority split among different bureaucracies within the organization and often split among multiple sites. So these people have responsibilities which might overlap or there might be gaps between them and somehow they have to work together. Often things fall into the cracks. Often there's no budget for working out problems with older facilities, even if the problems are recognized. Often the people who do the risk management are insurance mindset people. They think, well, we'll just get insurance to avoid that problem. Often the people who have the functional power to fix problems are low status, or low skill, or blue collar. And seldom do they have the training to, do, to actually fix the problems. For example, I had a client where the guy who had all the keys to everything was a vice president. But he wasn't high enough vice president so that he had his own office. He had a cube. And gaffers taped to the side of his cube was a key cabinet that had all the keys to all the buildings worldwide. So of course I took all of the keys when I did my penetration test. He got an office a few weeks later. Often the decision makers don't have the time or the skills to verify the vendor claims, and it's very hard to test the vendor claims unless you have solutions that are open source, like Bari's, for example. And all of these people and all of their vendors strongly believe in security through obscurity. They don't believe that making evident the limits of the, the products, their products, and uh, representing accurately exactly what the product can do would benefit their customers. So the common cop-outs you get from these bureaucrats are, that's not my job, which is now turned into, that's my vendor's problem, it's not my problem, even though it's still their reputation on the line if something goes wrong. Or, if they're a little bit more sophisticated, they say, we've never had that problem before, or I don't consider that a plausible threat, as if somehow they quantified the likelihood of it and decided it wasn't reasonable to spend money to protect against it. 
Or they say, we just have to raise the bar enough so the bad guys go to our neighbors or our competition. I only have to run, I don't have to run as fast as you, I just ha as fast as a bear, I just have to run a little faster than you, if you know that joke. Or they say, our controls are better than ordinary locks and keys, and the industry standard is ordinary locks and keys, so we're doing better. That, de that really depends on the value of your assets and how determined your adversary is. Or they say, you have to trust some party or they won't get any work done, or our contract says we have to give them complete access. But my favorite is, but that database is encrypted. <laughs> Without ever talking about key management or key distribution. So you saw that the 15 pin lock uh, had no more protection than the five pin lock against the bumping attack. And this is very reminiscent of the web uh, problem where WEP, 12-bit WEP, if there was such a thing existed, has the same strength as 1K-bit WEP because of the reuse of the IV space. Going down another level, we have physical security in a campus or a building where there's a lot of legacy to deal with. These buildings were not typically constructed with security in mind. They were typically made before that and bought and you move into the building and do as well as you can. So there might be partial height ceilings and hung ceilings which you could go over or raised floors which you could go under or wiring rooms out in the hall or wire runs through the public areas or networks that are all unsegmented or previously installed doors and locks which you just try to change the locks on and hope for the best. In a building you can ask yourself is there any perimeter which you can't almost ask yourself with networks any longer because of wireless. You can ask, is there any protected area or vault which you can serve, which you can establish as a basis for trust and put all the wiring and authentication devices in that vault and rely on those for subsequent decision making. Often you have to provide friendly facilities for joint venture partners or visitors or, you know, random people who walk in. And they have to be able to work in your space, physically close to you, but, you know, they could look at your screen or they could look at your keyboard. Then there are the building networks which control the heating and the air conditioning. Sometimes they control the alarm system and the door is also. And then often there are required back doors, legally required, or key escrow, for example, a thing called a Knox box. Here's an example of a Knox box. You may see them, you often see them on the outside of buildings. There's one here which is taped to the, uh, uh, almost taped to a wooden panel outside a door. And inside this box, there's a little uh, a flap under which there's a, a, a hole for a key, is a set of keys to your building. So the firefighters, when they get a call saying your building is on fire, they come to your building, they have a key to the Knox box, they open it up, they extract the keys to your building, and then they enter the building without causing any destruction. So what they have in the fire engine is this other device labeled central lock on the right. Do you have the laser pointer? Thanks. So the central lock, this is, has, you don't see the wiring, but it's connected to the dispatching radio for the firefighters. And down the radio link, they send an unlock code, which briefly allows them to take out the key, which opens the Knox box. This is done so that, the fi so that every firefighter doesn't have to have a key to every Knox box in town. And by the way, they are all keyed alike. So this is what I call a single point of failure in an entire town. And these keys are typically five pin medico cabinet locks, which are not difficult to either copy or pick. Not that difficult. Another typical problem with buildings is that multi-tenant buildings weaken the defensible perimeter because they have shared space. There are shared corridors and a reception area and an elevator lobby and they're probably master keyed and you have no control over the visitors to the other tenants and they have their own independent policies and you can't secure the building as a whole on any level. So what this means is that the weakest tenants, the tenants 
security policy that's the weakest becomes your de facto security policy. If they just buzz people in, well, you're at risk. So co-location facilities like these big server farm rooms and former telephone company buildings are very special cases of multi-tenant buildings. Anyone can rent a rack space in the building, and if they can come in, they can walk up to your cage or your rack, and they can probably touch your equipment. They can allow anyone, any vendor, to get in to fix their equipment, and that vendor representative, if authentic, <laughs> could walk up to your machine and touch it. So you end up at risk. It's kind of like being in a gated community where the motorcycle gang moves in down the block. Nothing you can do about it. Finally, we get down to the nuts and bolts level, which is what Bari's been operating on, which is locks, which is the component level where you have locks and doors and sensors and alarms, and somehow somebody has to design something to solve these problems. Now, design, I don't know how many of you ever took a course in design. Actually, how many of you have ever studied any kind of design discipline? Maybe 10%. But you all design, many of you design software, some of you design hardware. Design is a discipline which is not being taught, particularly in the US. It's not taught as an engineering discipline, it's certainly not taught to security designers. So let's start with doors. What are they made of? Are they single or double doors? Double glass doors often have a gap between them. What's within reach of that gap? Where and of what construction are the hinges? So if doors are simple, how can they go this wrong? Look at all of these things that somehow someone has tacked on the door. This is a fire door. That's the thing that lets you get out in case of a fire. You push it and uh, an alarm starts sounding, but it does open the door. But somehow someone decided to put this double bolt lock on the door, and there's another lock here, and there's another lock there, and there's a sensor and this chain to keep the door, and what's this bolt doing on completely the wrong side of the door? <laughs> Here's another one. This one has the same, it's another fire exit. It's also got a locked slide bolt here, which will prevent people from getting out in case of a fire, and various sensors and things. And here's a magnetic strike, which holds the door closed with a force of 1,500 pounds. I don't think I want to be on the wrong side of this door when there's a fire. Then we have locks that come in all sorts of forms, and every one of them has one or another kind of weakness. And the locks are mechanical. Maybe they interact with an electric strike or an electrified lock, which releases the lock when someone makes the decision to do that. And maybe there's a computer in which you, uh, you with a badge reader, and you put the badge against the reader, and it decides to open or not. Maybe they're even biometrics. There are problems with the locks themselves. You can't tell just by looking if they're locked or unlocked. So if somebody temporarily has access to the lock and unlocks it, and then you go home, but you think it's locked, it might be unlocked. And the dead lockers, the things that prevent the locks from just being opened with a credit card, for example, or a piece of spring steel, are often misinstalled, broken, or ineffective in my tests. I'd say 5% of dead lockers are just not working. Then there are often keyed locks on doors that have other kinds of access control. Why is there a keyed lock there at all? They say, oh, if, there's, if we have a power failure, we need somebody to be able to get through. Well, maybe a building needs exactly one keyed lock for that case. But it's not the case that every lock that has a badge reader on it also needs a key. When you ask them, who has that key? They say, well, we don't know. Nobody has it. A deadlocker is a little device which prevents the bolt from being pushed back. Um, it, it prevents the bolt from being forced open just with a piece of, uh, of uh, like a lever, or ordinary lever, or a credit card. Okay. So let's say the door is locked. It's operated by a badge system. Somehow you need to be able to open it. Either you have an emergency release or you have one of these switches called a request to exit switch. This is a mechanical switch. It might say push to exit. Here's an example of a bad one. 
two eggs that ring bell between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m.? Well, what do you do if nobody answers? You're locked in the, in the building is the implication. These switches are, you know, there's some fine details about the switches. The ones which are compliant with the current uh, Disabilities Act in the U.S. have a very low push strength, which means that if you can get to them from the outside, you may be able to push them with a piece of uh, wood or cardboard or metal. Here's my favorite request to exit switch. It says, please do not touch. Warning, do not touch. It makes you wonder what it's for at all. So here are the frameless glass doors I talked about, which are a problem. Um, architects love them. The executives love them because they look so open and transparent. And uh, there's a gap. If there was a request to exit switch just inside here, somebody could push something through the gap and trip it. Uh, there's a gap here between the two panes. Um, these doors, you can't see how they work. There's an, electri an electrified lock in the uh, hinge mechanism, which is activated by a badge access control system. And so these things are normally kept lock and locked, and there might be a badge reader on the outside somewhere, invisible to us. So how do they get unlocked if someone needs to leave? Well, there's a sensor called a request to exit sensor, which looks like this thing. It's a passive infrared device, which senses the difference in temperature between a hot object walking up to the door like a human and the background like the floor. And then it, un it opens the door. And these things have adjustable uh, sensitivity and adjustable width, adjustable beam in general. And you can see they have a 20 degree beam width but if you can put a hot object through the gap in the door and put it in the beam, then you may be able to persuade the sensor that a hot object has walked up to the door like a human and it will unlock the door for you. Some of these things sense motion instead of temperature and you can wave a Federal Express envelope through the door and it will open. Sorry about the quality of the graphics. Um, Th those are, uh, there are two kinds of strikes which hold the door open. The strike is this gadget which interacts with the bolt mechanism. This is the deadlocker, this little, almost impossible to view, half moon shaped protuberance in the door. It is pushed open, it's pushed to a halfway position when the door is closed. It's in this position right here in the, against the strike. And the bolt, which is the, exactly this shape, plops into this hole in the door frame. Well, unless the alignment of this bolt works with the electric strike is exactly perfect, the deadlock, the deadlocker is inactive, it turns out. It turns out there's an incompatibility between the biggest selling set of locks in the U.S. and the biggest selling set of electric strikes in the U.S. where the deadlocker doesn't work at all. Other problems in, involve exposed, uh, okay, so ma then there are magnetic strikes, which are often not on an uninterruptible power, so you just interrupt the power and the door is unlocked. They're not on battery backup. Often the magnetic strikes are on the wrong side of the door. Adhesive, stripe, adhesive tape on the magnetic strike on the, magnet, on the surface between the big magnet, an electromagnet, and a big piece of steel, a plate which is held shut by the electromagnetic, operate according to the inverse cube law. So if you can increase that distance by anything, even a piece of scotch tape, it dramatically reduces the holding power of a magnetic strike. And then you need those switches, which I mentioned. Often, the placement of the strike is wrong or the wiring is on the wrong side of the door. Sometimes the wiring is just exposed on the outside. Then there are problems with cylinders themselves, like Barry has demonstrated. You can pick, you can make a key. Even better, you can make a master key from an ordinary key. There are these kinds of cylinders called interchangeable core cylinders. There's a special key, a control key, which, let, which lets you remove the cylinder quickly and replace it with one of your choosing. So you can rekey the lock almost instantly. You don't need a locksmith. All you need is a spare set of cores. Often the control key is much more universal than any master key in these systems. So even if there isn't a master beyond the building, the control key may work for the entire campus. 
I know of many universities in this situation. And very few lock instances are needed to make either a master key or a control key by disassembling it or even not. I'll give you a reference to a paper by Matt, Matt Blaze on this subject later on. If you can find a lock in a public area or an open padlock, you know, often these sprout legs, you can often make a master key for the entire enterprise. The problem with mechanical locks is you can't revoke rights when you've lost a lock or a master key. So they decided electronic access controls would be great because you could have individual control over which door any person could open and you could revoke those rights instantly just by turning off their badge. But now there's a computer and a database involved and there's wiring between all of these components and there are protocols between them. For example, some of the components are these things called panels which are physically close to the door and the magnetic strike or the electric strike and the badge reader. And these things have caches of access rights because if the computer is down or the wiring is broken, you still want the door to allow people to get in. So the cache remembers the last state of locks, uh, last state of badges used at that door or perhaps in the entire building. So now you have a cache consistency algorithm where if somebody changes something in the database, they have to push the deltas to the, di to the different caches and invalidate certain lines of the caches. And you can bet that there are bugs in some of these cache updating algorithms. These panels are connected on local wiring to the badge readers and the doors that they control. And then they used to be connected on local wiring, perhaps a loop in the entire building, to the computer that had the database. But now they're on the network. And guess what? They don't use mutual authentication of the counterparties. They don't use challenge response. Almost all the communication is just TCP or UDP in the clear. No sign on, no passwords, no sessions, nothing. Not even serial numbers in a lot of these protocols. And all of these people have invented their own protocols. Many of them built products that were connected on RS-232 or 485 local wiring, and they had, then they had the market demand to network enable their product. So how did they do that? They bought a terminal controller, a standalone terminal controller, which on one side has a serial port, and on the other side has an Ethernet, and it's the moral equivalent of a, a connector a transformer, an adapter. It doesn't really do anything. You telnet to some port and you're connected to the serial port. Often these things have no access list, no IP filtering, no passwords, or even worse, they have default passwords which nobody ever changes. At least they don't have sniffers built in. And most of these devices have backdoors for installers and maintainers which are undocumented default passwords, default logins, or sometimes they're documented in the installation manual but the customers don't know about their existence. And what about those cards that you hold up to the doors? Those cards are primitive examples of modern RFID tags. They have a subnetted, you know, they basically just have a number on them. Sometimes it's a 32-bit number. Modern ones might even have 64 bits. But this is subnetted into a facility code and a card number. And the facility codes are not really controlled. So if you know that somebody is facility code 3294, you can go to a manufacturer and say, hey, I'm facility code 3294. Can you send me badges 1 through 100? And they'll do it. They won't ask you anything. You don't have to prove anything. Many of these cards are field programmable. So you can put your own facility code in. Most use no challenge response or any kind of authentication. So I figured somebody must have built a card reader and a card emulator that would replay this. And sure enough, I found an undergraduate at a university who did it a couple years ago. I'll give you the reference later on. Most of these things can be read remotely. All you need is, you know, the equivalent of a badge reader and a battery and a pick based recording device and you can walk up to someone in the elevator and read all the badges in their wallet. Or you could install it at a banquette at the luncheonette in the financial district and then follow the guy to work, figure out that he works at Goldman Sachs or something. Um, the low card numbers are more likely to be senior given to the early employees and more privileged 
but that hardly matters if you can read any card. You can do brute force attack on the number space. Be since none of these devices ever expect a brute force attack, they will log all the failures, but they take no countermeasures like lockouts, like exponential backoff, or anything. It's like Unix login in 1960. So are these more or less secure than keys? It's very hard for me to decide. Instant revocability gives you, and fine-grained access control, you can limit it to an individual door, are big advantages, but this kind of a class attack on them makes them very risky. So here's a case study that I did with Mark Chen a couple years ago of a Receptors GP3. Receptors is a company that makes these access, access control systems. And we found one in one of our uh, financial, uh, financial data services company we were auditing. And we were doing a complete audit, physical security, network security, social engineering, um, everything. So we found the badging system and I thought, great, can I make a badge that will let me get into anything? No problem. They plopped their SCO Unix machine on the network with, with non-standard addresses, but it was still on the, the normal network. They had serial wiring to the guard stations, so-called guard stations, which were at the reception desks in the various buildings, which were running terminal emulation on PCs, and they were running TCP to the panels in the various buildings. The root password was published in the user manual, R00T. Well, that was helpful. Of course, first I had to pick the lock on the door of the badge making office so I could get in and get to that, get to the console of the thing, but that wasn't that difficult. There was a dial-up modem, which Receptor's tech support said, oh, we think that should always be left on because they could have a problem. I asked them, how many people changed the root password? They say, oh, we don't think that's a good idea because then we wouldn't be able to support them. So I logged in as root and started poking around and I noticed that there were all these ports the thing was listening on and there were, all the source was on the machine for the convenience of the vendor because they had if defs and they would compile different versions of the code for their different customers. So I started looking at all the if defs, if def jetway, if def us house, if def LDS church, that's the Mormons, AMD who makes those wonderful processors, General Electric, University of Washington, Corning, House of Representatives, I already said, Senate of the US, University of Southern California, Yale, five airports mentioned by name. I was feeling great. <laughs> I realized I could have, well, no, I didn't want to change the software of any of these, of any of these customers, but I could have because I had their source code. It turns out their customers included more than 50 airports, the entire state prison system in one US state. I was visualizing musical cells. At midnight, open all the doors for five minutes and see what happens. <laughs> Courthouses, even a US spook agency. I thought I should tell the spook agency, and that is a separate story, which I will tell you over a beer. <laughs> so I looked at their database schemas and their tables, and that was really interesting because the system has this concept of pass key. Metaphors are powerful in security. So, and guards understand about pass keys. You say the magic word and it lets you in. Okay, so there was a pass key which lets you be a guard. There was a, it's really like a password without a login. So, you knew the right word, you could be a guard. You knew the right word, you could be the system manager. And all of these things were stored in a table lightly obfuscated you know, the moral equivalent of ROT13. So, looking at the passkey validation code, we noticed there was this undocumented feature. If you typed in a number, the right magic function of today's date, it will let you be the system manager. This was not in the, the manuals anywhere. Nobody knew anything about it. So, of course, given that, you could become the system manager on a dial-up line, uh, or you could, you could enable or disable badges, you could do the magic cells thing that I mentioned, you could cause immediate diagnostic events to occur, you could even create stealth badges, which had unlocked access, unlogged access. And the reason for that was because of a misplaced right curly bracket in the logging code, which we noticed because it was looking up the badge and if it didn't find it in some table, then it wouldn't log 
the lookup, it would go on and do some other check which had to fail before it would do the logging. So we, we could create special badges in the database which had special powers and could do things unlogged. All the code downloads to the panels, the badge controllers, were stored on the Unix host. They were unsigned. Of course, they had uh, CRC codes for, so that integrity would be guaranteed before doing the update, but no signature, no cryptographic signature. We could also disable the logging mechanism and nobody would notice. The fact that the logging mechanism was disabled would not be visible to any panel. It would just spill its events and then erase them. So if you briefly disabled the logging mechanism, those log events would be gone. So the vendor in this case was just as much in denial as uh, in Bari's case. They accused us of using unfair tactics in reverse engineering their system. <laughs> they said that they said that a maker of Bar I, 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 I believe I'm quoting this guy almost verbatim in some magazine. Uh, he said, the maker of barbed wire should not be pilloried when someone leaves the gate open. I didn't even understand the metaphor. <laughs> okay. So, another thing you have to worry about is sensors and alarms. When is sensed movement in a protected area an alarm event, and when is it just normal? The problem with badges just on the outside of your door is, you can't tell if movement in the event is a normal case or an alarm event. The only way you can do that is by forcing everyone to badge in and to badge out and counting the occupants that remain in the space. And when the count goes to zero, in that case, any movement in the space is an alarm event. Usually, the alarms are not integrated with the presence systems or the environmental systems or the badging systems, making this kind of design difficult to implement. So if you can if you can trip these sensors from outside the protected area, you can do all sorts of things aside from opening the door using the request to exit sensor. You can also cause nuisance alarms. And I think Ross Anderson has measured how many nuisance alarms are typically responded to by an agency like a police department or a, uh, an alarm service. I think it's something like 2.5 and then they give up. And then they say, oh, there's something wrong and we'll fix it in the morning. And all alarm events after that are ignored for the rest of the night. This is a social engineering opportunity. So sensors are wired to the control elements, usually in a closed loop, and the wiring can be manipulated as well. And often these wireless sensors are battery powered, and the wireless protocols they use are extremely naive because they're much more concerned about battery consumption than, and installability than anything else. They're like garage door openers, and they're more like garage door openers in their sophistication than like crypto components. Video is another double-edged sword because the bad guys can use video to photograph your moving the safe dial or you're typing your pin in or you're typing your password in but you can also use video now, cheap USB cameras, to detect the guy from the co-location site coming into your cage and opening your rack when he's not supposed to be in there. Or anyone opening your rack, right? Why are they doing that? Concealed video is ubiquitous these days. You can get video cameras and things that look like ordinary household items of every kind. You have to get the video right or you won't be able to use it. And that is an optical problem with lenses and coverage areas and all that stuff. Plus, you have to be able to search it once you've recorded all this video, especially if you don't know exactly when some event occurred. I'm not going to go into any more detail on this. So here's a colo case study. I'm persona non grata at this very famous large colocation site uh, and all of its uh, many tentacles because I succeeded too well in breaking in. Um, it's a very large facility, bigger than a football field, um, with vaults and cages and cabinets on the raised floor, and all the common data wiring is overhead, and all the raised floor is the plenum for the cold air, and that's where the power is. Heat is the biggest problem right now in co-location facilities, heat and power, not communication. Joey Ito told me that the Japanese power company has a big advantage in supplying co-location facilities because they have cheap power, unlimited amounts of it. 
So the facility issued their own anonymous looking prox card credential with a, um, with a, in a proprietary format. You could still read it, but you couldn't order these easily. The cabinets that were out in the halls had wafer locks in common areas, which were a joke. They could be picked in less time than, you know, three pin wafer locks. So anyone who was a, how about turning off the cell phone and being here? Okay. So anyone could pick it and open your cage for you. The cages themselves only went up a little bit higher than I am tall. There was video, partial video, but the secure place, this was their excuse for existence, were these vaults. And the vaults had video pointing at the front door, hand geometry readers for the entry, electrified locks, a door open magnetic switch in the door so they could tell if the door was being forced, and a motion detector just inside the door. I thought, okay, well, that might work. But the vaults themselves were really prefabricated structures with four walls, and the floor was still the raised floor, and the ceiling was still the dropped ceiling. So you could enter through the ceiling, or you could enter through the floor. I thought that was an opportunity. First, I had to get in the building. That wasn't very hard. You need some identity. You need some concept of identity for these controls to work well, so the fact that they issued their own credentials seemed to me to be pretty strong, because anyone can make something that looks like a driver's license. It's nice that the credential conveys the right, somehow conveys the right to do something, rather than, you know, a driver's license being a, a de facto identity document in the US. Not only does it convey your right to drive, but it also says how old you are, talks about your right to drink, might have your social security number on it, might have a thumbprint. Why is all that crap there? All it, originally, it just said you had the right to drive, and that's what it's for. So the fact that all of these rights and responsibilities are being overloaded on a single document is a big problem because it means that the bar can check your ID and steal your identity. So here's the thought question at the bottom of the screen for you to think about. Is it better for your colo to accept your driver's license or to issue you their own credential containing a shared secret with them or to check your face in a database? So there were a few months that pointed to identity theft as a big growth area. There's this guy, Abraham Abdullah, who stole 80 of the 400 richest Forbes identities and opened accounts in the names of Paul Allen and Tom Siebel and all these you know, lions of industry in the US. This was detected when uh, Siebel was in Davos at the World Economic Forum and he got a call from his broker who said, Paul, you're your account is out of balance with its investment objectives due to that purchase of a house in Switzerland. He said, what house? <laughs> and they managed to undo a large wire transfer in record time. I thought that was very hard to do, but they managed to do it. The same month, VeriSign issued some class three signing, code signing certificates in the name of Microsoft Corporation to parties who have never been uh, accused of it, never been uh, ap apprehended. And the same time, the General Accounting Office in the U.S. reported that you could buy f assault weapons using phony driver's licenses. So I started, when all these things happened in the same week or two, thinking that identity was an important issue. I actually looked into the, driver, into the buying of a weapon thing, and I discovered that you fill out a form, and it asks you questions like, are you a fugitive from justice? Are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or etc.? Have you been adjudicated mentally defective? And if you're mentally defective enough to answer yes to any of these questions, <laughs> you won't get a weapon. But they check your driver's license. They check it against the database. And if you were unlucky enough to make a phony driver's license in the name of a known felon, you will not get a weapon. They do not check that your driver's license is authentic or that it was ever issued. Of course, everything you need to create identity is available on eBay. Here's what I bought. <laughs> and here's what you can buy if you make your identity. <laughs> this is bought by the General Accounting Office, not by me. So physical security, this is an entirely different dimension of physical security. You know, the guns and 
guns and badges kind, but these are scary devices which you've doubtless run into. They're key loggers. They work on PS2 interfaces and they store up to two megabytes of keystrokes. Everything you type, everything you type and backspace over having had second thoughts about it. It's the closest thing to thought control that there is, thought recording. It will record your dreams and your, uh, <laughs> your intentions even if you think better of them later on and you don't send that email. They cost less than $100. So if someone has momentary access to your PC keyboard interface, they can install these and you probably won't notice it there. Or they can install a keyboard with this built into it, inside the keyboard. But then they have to come back and retrieve it to get your keystroke information. So we knew about Tempest shielding and we, now we know about the keyboard interfaces and somebody told me about looking at uh, power attacks on the, uh, on the LEDs on the keyboards which would enable you to determine things like keystrokes and disk data written. I didn't know about that one. But somebody, these two guys at IBM Research in Almaden, uh, Dmitry Azanov and Rakesh Agrawal, discovered that you could record the acoustic signals off keyboards and the, the template of the keyboard is like a drum. It has a distinctive sound to it. And by doing the right kind of digital signal processing, you could decode with a high probability which key was pressed. And you could even do that across a telephone connection. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you the citation to their work, which is very impressive. And suggests many possibilities. So, it was, it was suggested that by recording the sound of a dot matrix printer, you could figure out what was being printed a while ago. They also did some experiments on telephone keypads and ATM pin pads, which they could recognize with fairly, with modest reliability. Not as good as a keyboard. Parti so here's the acoustic signal of the keyboard. There's a, there's a little signal when your finger touches the key and then there's a big signal, that's this I think, and then there's a big signal when the key touches the plate at the bottom of the key. And it turns out every one of these, many of these keys sound different. So what they did is they did formant extraction, a pretty naive formant extraction on this, uh, on this uh, signal, on these acoustic signals, developed a normalized FFT, and then they fed it into a neural network and, uh, you know, just so that there's some science in this talk, I'll, I'll uh, explain to you what this is. This is 30 keys. They trained this individual keyboard, uh, the neural network, with this specific keyboard. And then they tried keystrokes of Q, W, E, R. And after training, nine times out of ten, the Q was suggested as the first likely candidate when they pressed a cue after training. Zero times it was suggested as the second alternative and zero times as the third alternative. The W, nine times as the first alternative, one time as the second alternative. So you can see that the recognition of E is quite weak. It was not. For some reason it didn't produce a distinct signal. But the R and the W and the Q and the T is perfect. You know, most of the time either the right key was suggested as the first possibility or as the second possibility in any given sequence. The average depth of the correct sequence was 1.99, less than two. So if you could record a trained keyboard acoustically, and this was done at a distance of one meter with an ordinary PC microphone, um, you could reduce the key space of the passwords by quite a lot if you wanted to do brute force search on the remaining key space, for example. This worked just as well uh, on different kinds of keyboards of the same, not quite as well, on, you know, if you have a Dell 300 keyboard and you had two other examples of it and you trained it on one instance, it kind of worked on the other two instances, but not quite as well as if you trained it on the actual keyboard that was in use. It didn't seem to matter who was typing. It didn't seem to matter if they hunt and pecked, if they typed rapidly. So what solutions do we have to this? Well, you could mute the microphone. You could make people authenticate when they're offline. 
most of the solutions involve telephony integration or keep people away from your keyboards or don't use keyboards or silence the keyboards. One interesting alternative, there's a patent which was filed, which sensed people's eye motions and they would move their eyes and look at the right thing on the screen. <laughs> that was completely silent. That was the way they'd enter their password. Or don't use passwords at all, use tokens, where uh, replay attacks are limited in scope. Other scary devices which involve physical access are unauthorized wireless bridges, which can be installed very quickly. And if you encrypt the traffic, the good guys can't figure out what, what traffic is being leaked. They might even say, oh, it's, in, it's using encryption. It must be one of ours. Well, right now, rogue access points have been discovered in many installations. And it's just a matter of time before you notice one. Of course, that three-digit number on the back of your credit card is readable with momentary possession of your credit card. And by the way, a single DES key is used to verify all of the credit card numbers in a batch. You might think that by now they would understand that they could use random numbers, but no. That would, you know, three bits per car, three bytes per card, that must be, you know, at least $10 worth of magnetic storage for a bank. So the real problem are systems are, increase, are decreasingly designed or built by people who understand their behavior, and the people who make security decisions have no training in analyzing the systems that now have computers in them. And they're much less increasingly, they're almost untested. You just believe your vendor claims. Don't believe the vendor claims. I won't talk about these trends. You know all about them. All your secrets with you on your Palm Pilot or on your laptop. Here's my screw the vendors slide. This is a tombstone from 1870 in memory of Ellen Shannon, age 26 years old, who was fatally burned by the explosion of a lamp filled with R.E. Danforth's non-explosive burning fluid. Well, vendors still produce products that are snake oil today, and the only way to keep them honest is to audit their performance very carefully contractually require audits, require them to disclose security flaws to you as their customers, so you know what the limits of the product are, do independent design and code reviews, make sure they use employee security as rigorous as your own employee security, and as I said, disclose. So science is not going to solve these problems for you because many of them are people problems and social engineering problems are very difficult to solve. They can be solved partly by design, make a design where somebody can't leak a secret because they don't know the secret. They have to get the secret or a portion of it from the customer on the telephone. People will always hide the building master key in the coffee cup. And people will resist heavy-handed authority so they will ignore security protocols as much as possible. They will also cover up even the most severe of incidents. When I stole all the master keys at that bank, Nothing happened. I was expecting there to be a noise, a report. Something, somebody would have said something. So I went to my client, who was a senior vice president of the company, and I said, so here are the keys, and I plopped these keys on his desk. What do we do now? Several things we could do. We could go to the guy and say, have you lost a set of keys? Or we could just wait and see what happens, or what would you like to do? He said, let's wait and see. Right decision. A week later, nothing had happened. So we decided it was time to call a halt to it. We went to the guy and said, by chance, did you lose a set of keys recently? He said, yes. I wondered what happened to them. I thought maybe I brought them home or, well, what did you do? Well, I went to my buddy who has the other set of keys and I said, Stan, I, I misplaced my keys. Can I borrow yours? And then I went to the locksmith and I made another set. <laughs> this is for a different crowd than you. You know all about this stuff. The risks are yours, the reputation is yours. You can't shift, you can't shift the risk onto somebody else just by using an outsourcer or a vendor. It's often cheaper to create compensating controls to detect problems like a break-in 
than to prevent a break-in in the first place. And this is where obscurity actually adds a little bit of value. If there is some, security, some obscurity, somebody might trip your alarms. And you need to have policies in place that are socially appropriate, culturally appropriate, and reasonable, or people will just ignore them. God is in the details. Get somebody on your side, like you guys, who understand what's going on, and point out the problems. Full disclosure is a great thing. Test everything. Healthy level of paranoia is a really good thing, particularly if you can't trust yourself. In Germany, we must quote from Goethe, when at all possible. So here are some references. Here's a quote from it. I can copy a proximity card at least as easily as I can take an impression of a key. So this kid did this prox card reader replay device several years ago, and there are pictures in complete, pretty complete tools at this, at this URL. Here's the reference to the acoustic emanations talk. Matt Blaze on making master keys and on safe, safe cracking. Matt Blaze is a computer science professor at University of Pennsylvania who's applying an information security mindset to physical security. So you'll find his approach to be very familiar if you do a lot of information security. My door pictures are from the Securitech gallery of illegal or badly locked doors, which you can find there. The web is a wonderful thing. You can find almost anything there. And questions now for me or for Bari or afterwards by email. Please use the microphone if you have questions. And thanks for listening. Wasn't there another slide with the... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Here are some references of Bari's on there should be, that's a, a typo, there should, should be www.tool, T-O, three O's in tool, that's correct, T-O-O-O-L dot N-L, and there's the Vinkhaus press release, of course this will be on the website, I'm sorry, okay, now, now you get to see my desktop again, <laughs> and don't ask me what those files are, please. Okay, I just got a personal question. How did you get in that job? <laughs> How did I get into this job? Well, I've been doing locksmithing since I was an undergraduate because I worked at the radio station at Columbia University in the 1960s, a period of student unrest. And we wanted to report on the kids, you know, breaking into buildings and having demonstrations and getting beaten up and tear gassed without getting beaten up and tear gassed ourselves. So I made keys to the tunnels under the campus and all the buildings so we could just pop up in a magic place and report on it. And since then, I've been sort of an amateur locksmith. But about 10 years ago, uh, my company uh, called Securify started doing security audits. And I said, you know, it's completely ridiculous to ignore social engineering and physical security because the bad guy is not ignoring those possibilities. They will look for the weakest link, whatever it is, and use whatever technique is at their disposal. And maybe they have multiple skills or perhaps telephony. You know, all of these things are in the grab bag of attackers these days. So we ha had a much more uh, gestalt, um, uh, security auditing process than the usual checklist or the usual we only look at the network or we only look at the hosts kind of thing. So we really try to understand the process and make attack scenarios. So for the last five years I've just been practicing the complete uh, spectrum of attack and defense. Hello. Um, I have one question here. Hello. Here. Um, the first one to Mark, um, what do you think about smoking policies that force people to go through all the perimeters of a company regularly a few times a day? I mean, it sounds like a bad idea for me. Mm, I'm sorry to say I'm such an anti-smoker that I think whatever makes it difficult for you to smoke is probably a good thing. Okay. <laughs> but, 
But you're right. This this is a cultural this hand, is a culturally you can walk loaded your dream box question. The guys was out for smoking to the data center. It's also a good thing. I mean, but for the other side, right? Well, you have a badge, and you should use your badge to walk out and walk in. Yeah. And if it's a good design, there should be a man trap at the exit, so only one of you can go in at a time, and someone can't tailgate in after you. But there is a benefit to smoking, despite what I've said about it, and that is that there's a lot of communication among the smokers, which is across the boundaries in the bureaucracy. So you'll find out all sorts of things about your company that you didn't know, and they will find out all sorts of things about your, your work that they didn't know, because you're all s common addicts. Okay, I have two so, other quick questions. like. Um, in challenge response systems, like with the electronic locks, you have a token with RFID, whatever. I heard that um, there are like man in the middle devices, like um, like a suitcase you carry with you. One you bring near to the guy with the token, the other one you bring right in front of the door, and they can exchange like remotely the challenge response thing. Um, yeah, that that's, that indeed is true. Uh, I'm not sure if such a device exists, but at least in theory, you could do it like that. Um, if the people who implement the challenge response are halfway clever, they just take the uh, speed of light for, say, three meters, and if the challenge to the response, or if the response to the challenge takes longer than the speed of light of three minutes, or three meters, um, it's, it's, it's useless. So this should be a way to defeat it, but if it's actually done like that, uh, I don't know. Okay. I also heard that. Okay. Oh, devices are around. The second, uh, the last one is like the area codes on the locks you showed us, like from Berlin, this 254, whatever it was. Is it just on the keys or is it also on the locks? No, it's, it's just on the keys. Too bad. Why? Thank you. Because otherwise you just have to look on the locks. Well, the, the, the thing is, if I see a lock in Berlin from this brand, uh, no, okay. 99 out of 100, Most, yeah. uh, if, 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 if I go to the lock shop in that area, uh, 9 out of 10 times, I will just get the correct uh, blank. Nothing keeps you from going to the lock shop and buying a lock. And then you'll have a lock. What could be bad? Sorry, you've been waiting a while? The man, with, the man in the aisle here holding the microphone? I think oh, he's I handing out the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> One of the angels. Uh, my question is about your um, crypto fund. Uh, if we talk about exportation of the crypto, what is the regulation in Germany? This is free or this is some restriction depending uh, on the, the country? There are some uh, restrictions. We, we are not allowed to deliver the crypto phone to countries like Syria. And uh, we take it pretty seriously that phones do not end up there, uh, although you can never uh, exclude it 100 percent. Um, but yeah, there, there are some restrictions. But if you go to our website, CryptoPhone.de, uh, you can read all about what restrictions are there and why. Well, I think then uh, this is the end of, uh, Ask of, if there are more questions. of, of our talk. Is he going for a microphone? Well, I, I, I think okay. we're out of time anyway. Great. So, okay, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have any questions left uh, later on. Of course. Sorry. Hello, mother. Thank you very much. Yeah.